Today we are going to talk about bringing planetary objects to the to the lab, building planetary simulation chambers, and which are a very uh, pro, very potential tools for doing studies of astrobiology. So, what is astrobiology? I mean, one of the de definition could be the study of life on Earth and its search in the rest of the universe to understand its origin, evolution, distribution, and future. So furthermore, the, the question that it comes is the, the, what, the, how to study the origin of life. If there is, there was life in other planets. And furthermore, those days, the interesting field of searching for biosignatures. So the answer could come by doing planetary exploration, by meaning the space mission of the planetary mission to do the, the experiments in situ in the object the planet that we are going to, to study. On the other hand, would come from the planetary analogs, I mean, meaning to study Atacama Desert, Antarctica, or even Rio Tinto here in, in Spain. And our approach is doing laboratory experiment by planetary simulation. If we make a bit of comparison between the three different approach, the planetary uh, exploration has a unique and primordial knowledge because we explore the, the real sample but it has also some risk involved in the complexity of the missions. Furthermore, has a high economic cost and time for technological uh, development. On the other hand, the planetary analogs, it minimizes the cost than the space mission, and is uh, also doing in situ exploration, but it has a big limitation of not, we are not able to modify a natural environment, an environment that is in nature, we cannot modify the physical or chemical conditions. So furthermore, we can uh, try to bring those uh, planetary objects to the, to the lab to put it, the conditions, physical and chemical conditions in, inside of a container. And that is the thing that we are going to, I'm going to try to explain today. So uh, planetary simulation chambers can be a very good complement of the expensive space mission at involve lower cost, the possibility of multiple testing versatility and great accessibility. So if we do a bit of history on, on the planetary simulation chambers, we could go back to the 1960s where the first uh, simulation chambers were a simple vacuum system, which tried to reproduce the atmosphere by a gas composition and temperature. Those systems were evolving and then the, the chambers were simulating some physical parameters and also we try to control, and it was some implementation with in situ gas analyzed techniques. And furthermore, uh, it's relevant to simulate the, the environment, but it's also very interesting to try to measure the things in situ. So it's for that, that is very relevant to set up uh, techniques in situ. So it was doing uh, spectroscopy such as infrared, and furthermore, nowadays, the chamber has uh, several complementary in situ techniques, as uh, for example, the one that I'm going to show later on. It has infrared or Raman spectroscopy in order to characterize the mineral and, and interaction with the organic in the inside of the chamber, doing inside uh, in situ experiments. The future would be the, to build more sophisticated chambers with a greater control over the physical chemical parameters and also to include a number of the of the techniques to do the characterization in situ of the of the chamber. So we can see here the I mean a very simple um, chamber and then the, the development of more sophisticated ones. So um, the planetary simulation chambers could be defined as an infrastructure to develop in the lab consisting in a stainless steel container, as we can see in the in the picture, and inside of that, we try to recreate the atmosphere and surfaces um, composition of the planetary objects in a controller way. Have to control the physical chemical parameters of those um, uh, moons and planetary objects that we want to simulate. Controlling the pressure, the temperature, the radiation source. As it's not a very easy task to build that kind of. Uh, I mean, it, it has a band. I mean. It has some advantage as uh, 
is cheaper than a space mission and also is con is uh, possible to control the conditions, which was not uh, possible in the terrestrial analogs, and we can repeat the experiment. But furthermore, as it's not an uh, easy task to build that kind of uh, system, I'm going to explain a bit the technical um, requirements of the, of the system in order to carry on with some scientific um, experiments that we are doing or scientific projects that we are running on the, on the chamber. So this is the, this is the idea to put inside of the, of the chamber of the stainless steel container the, the conditions of the planetary of the moon that we, we desire to, to simulate. And in our case, I'm going to present the planetary atmosphere and surface chamber. Um, here, at CAP, it has been um, designed, built, set up, and is fully operated. This is the main chamber. It has a, five, a 500 millimeters long by 400 millimeters diameter. Di this is the main body. But as I'm going to, to show, in order to, to make a very versatile system, when we, were, when we came with the idea to build a simulation chamber, it was not the boat to simulate only one, one object. We wanted to simulate the majority of the planetary objects that um, have uh, low pressure and low temperature. So in order to reach all those conditions, it was a very tricky design. So I'm going to to explain a bit more about, about that in order to understand that we use bulk for introducing the gases, that we may need a different gauge to control the, the pressure or different sensors to control the, the temperature. This is the main picture, one of the pictures of the planetary atmosphere and surface chamber at, at CAP. The pressure range where we can uh, work is from five uh, millibars to five ten to nine millibars. It means nine order of magnitude. We can uh, control the gas composition, as we can see here, that is the, the, the manifold with the different bulb. We introduce the gas through those bulbs inside of the, of the chamber. Then we can, have, we can introduce also some water vapor. This is a container filled full of uh, we put water inside. We sublimate the water, and it goes inside of the chamber through the, through the different pipes, through the, through the gas system in order to have some water vapor inside of the, of the chamber. Furthermore, we control the atmospheric condition through the residual gas analyzer, that is this one that they show in the, in the midst of the, of the picture. I mean, it's a, a small chamber attached to the main body in order to control the, the condition of the atmosphere composition. So that is a, a rack from our, our system. And as you can see, there are many controllers from the pumps, from the bulb and also to, to set up the, the different um, the pumping steps that we need to reach in order to, to have the, the requirement condition for the different planetary objects. So move on, we also control the temperature on the, on the surface and the range is from 10 Kelvin to 325 Kelvin. We have a, a closed system, a helium closed system connected to the sample holder in order to cool down the, the sample. The sample is placed here in the, in the removal container that we can see here. It's made of copper with a gold coverage layer to improve the thermal conductivity. That is the cryostat that from, the, from, the, from the manipulator. And then here we can see the sample holder and also the silicon diode that is the one controlling the temperature. So the sample holder, the size of the sample holder is from five to 35 millimeters. And as I was saying before, it's important to make the implementation of different in-situ techniques in order to, to gain potential of the, of, the, of the instrumentation. So in our case, the in-situ analysis techniques are ultraviolet spectroscopy, reflection absorption infrared spectroscopy, and Raman spectroscopy. Here we can see the setup of the, of the UV, the ultraviolet spectroscopy. We can measure the samples in transmittance as this setup, or we can measure in, in reflectance the, um, the, wave, uh, the, the spectra of the, of the lamp, in this case, the deuterium lamp for 200, 500 nanometers. For the infrared setup, as we can see here, 
the, the spectrometer and the detector and the optical path, the, the mirrors are outside of the sample, but we focus the signal inside of the sample, on the top of the sample, as we can see here. And then the reflection it goes through the the reflection it goes through the other window and focus on the on the detector. Here we can see the small windows in order to focus the the signal inside of on the top of the of the sample. So the planetary atmospheres and surfaces chamber, we can see the different spectroscopies. Here we have the UV spectroscopy, the infrared the spectrometer, and the Raman plot. We can see the, the spectrometer from the from the infrared, the spectral radiometer from the UV, and the Raman setup. That is having the, the, the Raman proof inside of the of the chamber a few millimeters distance from the from the sample that we are going to analyze. So in order to test our chamber, we were simulating the different conditions. Our upper limit is seven millibars, is the Mars conditions. So here we can see a plot from the mass spectrometer controlling the different uh, gas composition. So in the first step, we're setting up the Mars atmosphere. And the second step is pulling down to 150 Kelvin. We can also do some uh, cycles of temperature between 150 and 280 uh, Kelvin. So that is our upper limit. Our lower limit is Europa, 10 to minus nine millibars. So in this case, we set that we pull down the, the sample, the, the sample holder until 50 Kelvin, and then we start introducing the gas at different steps uh, until we reach the 95% of oxygen atmosphere at uh, 50 Kelvin. Furthermore, th those objects, uh, Mars or Europa, are very interesting in, in the astrobiology field. Furthermore, that we, we can control the condition in the lower limit or the upper limit, it doesn't mean that we can control the condition at any intermediate state. So we have chosen Triton, the Neptunian moon, which pressure is 10 to minus two in order to test more for technical reasons than from an astrobiological point of view. We need to, uh, to see that we, uh, we are able to, to reach also the intermediate um, pressure values. So in this case, we were setting the Triton atmosphere um, and a mixture of several gases that we can see there. And then we were pulling down until 38 Kelvin. So um, in this case, I'm going to summarize the technical specification of the, of the simulation chamber. The total pressure, it goes from five millibars to five, 10 to minus nine millibar. The temperature range, it goes from 10 Kelvin to 325 Kelvin. The gas composition is uh, regulated and controlled by the residual gas analyzer by a mass spectrometer. And then the sample size, it can be from five to 35 millimeter wide. The irradiation source, mainly we have used deuterium UV lamp, but we have also testing ions and electron five uh, kb. And the analysis techniques are UV, uh, infrared, and, and Raman. So we have been testing for several planetary objects. And as I say, we have been um, setting up different spectroscopy to, to measure the chemical and physical change in situ. So uh, coming to the science in our, in our group, we are focusing on the research of uh, the study of the interaction between biomolecules and mineral surfaces in the context of prebiotic chemistry and planetary exploration. So for example, we study process on, on minerals which absorb and generate new compounds by photocatalysis, for example, with a mineral sulfide as a pirate. We also study the different nature of uh, minerals in order to favor the concentration of uh, molecular concentration on on the, on the surface of those minerals. We have been testing also minerals which they can drive chemistry, changing the, the chemical form of the amino acid absorbed on the, on the top of the surface, and also testing which uh, clay's minerals could be a, a good reservoir for molecules and to preserve the, the signatures, to, to look for those molecular signatures in uh, uh, other planetary bodies. Furthermore, these are the main research of our uh, group. 
but I would like to show that we are not um, with the planetary simulation chamber. We don't stop there. We have several uh, collaboration projects in order to show the versatility of the of the chamber. I'm going to show a bit some of the of the projects that I'm going to to explain. But we have been doing a study on minerals on Mars, habitability with lichens, photochemistry of peptide molecules, prebiotic chemistry, sensors, uh, studying bacteria, also nucleic bases, some proteins and peptides, inseres, and not nontronite as a nice um, clay reservoir for biomolecules, the calibration target of uh, March 2020, uh, some other microorganisms, UV photocatalysis process, and also nanoparticles to absorb CO2. So I would like to show a bit of the, 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 versatility, the versatility of the potential of the planetary simulation chamber. So I have picked up some of those examples to, to see which experiments we are, we are running on, on, the, on the system. The first one that I would like to highlight that is, um, is the Phoenix uh, Mars uh, mission. This one has been um, uh, it has been uh, led by the University of Arizona on behalf of NASA and managed by the GPL. And it was focused on the study the, sta the, the history of Mars water in all these phases, search for evidence of habitable zone. And the, we, we make a very nice collaboration with the PI of the, of the mission with uh, Nilton Reno. And he was coming to PAP and telling us that he was watching that kind of, uh, of drops of map in the, in the, in the leg of the, of the platform of the robot. And it, it was changing during the day, during the night. So we wanted to understand which process was taking place there and what, what possible explanation could, could, could it be that for. So we proposed an experiment and we were running that one in the, in the simulation chamber. We have a small amount of sodium perchlorate and we introduce inside of the chamber and simulate the Mars atmospheric conditions, but we were putting some water vapor on the, on the system. And we could see, even by eyes, the evolution of the, of the perchlorate. So in the beginning was in this state and then was evolving almost to reach, uh, to melt into a liquid solution. So the, the mineral was uh, behaving like a sponge trapping the water and then almost to, to come into to a liquid solution. We could see that by eyes. But we could also monitorize those chemical changes, physical changes by infrared spectroscopy. And the most surprising was that we have been proven that the liquid scent of uh, sodium perchlorate could form that aqueous solution at temperature, temperatures as low as 225 Kelvin in a simulated Martian atmosphere. So, that was a very good explanation for the for the process that they were uh, seeing in in Mars, and we could also make a comparison between the same uh, process that it was happening in our sample holder. So the liquid sand was a, a possible uh, explanation for this uh, phenomenon observed in the in the Phoenix uh, leg, and that it was having many implications for the presence of liquid uh, saline water on Mars. So that was a very nice collaboration between a um, planetary mission and our uh, team in the, in the laboratory. If we move on in a, a bit different example, uh, we were studying the pyrethine-induced UV photocatalytic abiotic nitri nitrogen fixation and their implication for early atmospheres and, and life. So we wanted to investigate how minerals could play a role and the idea was, why do we care about nitrogen? I mean, nitrogen is essential element for life. It's essential also for many key metabolic activities. And uh, before nitrogen is an uh, bio biochemical usable form, it must to be a biotic process to fix the, the, the nitrogen. So we were testing several minerals and sulfides 
but I'm going to focus on pirate, on the iron sulfide uh, mineral, that it was the, the most interesting uh, experiment that we did. So pirate sulfate, we clean it by, um, uh, uh, by the, the solution, acid solution, sulfidic uh, acid solution, and then we rinse and dry the, the sample. And then we were running the several experiments. We were putting the, the surface under ultra high vacuum conditions, meaning absence of nitrogen, under seven millibar air and air, meaning those, those uh, atmospheres having a, a percentage of, uh, of nitrogen and with the UV uh, lamp on and off. I would like to focus on this, in this case in particular, in the one that we were irradiating the pirate surface at air conditions with the, with the UV lamp on. And that uh, system was characterized by XPS and infrared spectroscopy before and after the UV exposition. As uh, I'm aware that I don't know if everybody from the, from the community knows about uh, XPS, XPS is a X-ray photomission spectroscopy. It's based on photoelectric effect in which a free electron is ejected from an atom after it has been absorbed the, the energy of a photon from a source, uh, meaning that we shoot the sample with X-ray and then we, we remove the, 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 the electron from the external core of the, of the atom. Which means that that means that it's a surface uh, sensitive technique that we have information about the chemical composition of the surface and also the element that they are bind to. So it's a very um, potential uh, technique for those kind of study. So coming back to the pirate surface, we were uh, doing the irradiation of the surface at air condition at atmosphere that we have uh, nitrogen, and then if we see the carbon oxygen and nitrogen XPS. We can see that the black and the red spectra, they look quite similar. It was the clean pirate and the pirate irradiate under the high vacuum condition under uh, atmosphere without any uh, nitrogen. And then if we irradiate the pirate under uh, atmosphere with a uh, nitrogen, we see the blue spectra, which means that the carbon species, we see carbonate and CN and CS species. The oxygen oxide species increased but the more remarkable uh, feature is the presence of the nitrogen. We see here the nitrogen species at 400.9 electron volts, meaning that it could be suggesting or it could be related to ammonium salt. In order to understand which was the compound that we were having on the, on the top of the, of the surface, we were running infrared. I mean, infrared is a technique uh, the majority of you, uh, of you maybe have been used or, or you know. So it's a stimuli, we stimulate the, the surface and we measure the, the response. We st the stimulus is an infrared beam and then the vibration excitation of, of surface atom by absorption of infrared. So here we monitorize the, the, the infrared spectrum before and after doing the irradiation, that is the clean pirate. And then when we uh, irradiate the, the sample, we can see here, the, the different bands that they are correlate with the ferrous ammonium sulfate. So by the both complementary spectroscopy, XPS and infrared, help us to identify the nitrogen signal suggesting that compound ferrous ammonium sulfate and the fixation of those uh, of this uh, compound on the on the pirate sulfate. We wanted to understand a bit uh, deeply this process. And we thought that the, the ammonium sulfate is an inorganic salt, which um, salt that is high with high solubility. So we rinse the, the pirate uh, surface. So the red one is the one when we have irradiate and we have the ammonium salt, the carbonate and the sulfates. And then if we wash the surface, if we rinse the surface, we, go, uh, we see that, that the spectra, the blue spectra is after rinsing, which means that we have removed the, the ammonium salt, the carbonate, and the sulfate. So indicate that the nitrogen species are highly soluble in water, which was expected from ammonium salt. 
So it was easy to remove the contact, uh, to remove those species act on uh, contact with the, with the liquid water. So we proposed a system with a cycle of wet and dry uh, process, which uh, the ammonium was absorbed, was, uh, um, yeah, was uh, fixed on the, on the pirate surface and then released when it was in contact with water. Meaning that this ammonium, it was then available for periodic chemistry and as the building block of, of life in a, in a water solution, but the pirate surface is again exposed to the atmosphere in order to be ready for new catalytic reaction. So that it was a very it was having many many implications for the for prebiotic uh, chemistry. If we move further to some other very different uh, example, we have been studying to the organization of silica particles on gold surface in order to, to have a nanosensor, a CO marker detection and, and storage. So it was a novel synthetic approach. We can, he, we can see here the, how we were doing the procedure, the, the gold uh, sample, then we, we were putting some attachments, some link, and then the silicon, the silicon nanoparticles in order to have a self-organized two-dimensional order structure that we were uh, characterized spectroscopically and morphologically. Here we can see the 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 uh, the, tem, the same image scanning electron microscopy and also the AFM uh, atomic force microscopy. Um, we were doing those microscopy and spectroscopy in order to characterize those uh, slides with the uh, with the nanoparticles. And then we were introducing the gold sample with the nanoparticles inside of the past, inside of the simulation chamber, and we were setting up the Mars atmosphere. And we were so, we saw that the, it, was, um, uh, the, it was a very good tool for the T CO2 recognition at, this, at the standard Mars low pressure, as the nanoparticles of silica were able to detect and to store CO2 with a high sensibility at low CO2 concentration. So they were ideal candidate as a nanosensors. Furthermore, we wanted to improve those uh, conditions and we were testing that uh, primary amine groups, if we functionalize the, the molecule, as you have seen here, with amine groups, it was a key point in, in the process because we were almost improving the, the potential of those nanoparticles as they are energetically preferent uh, bending sites, those um, amine groups in comparison with the naked uh, nanoparticles that they have on, only the, the surface silenols. So they the can be proposed as a nano, nanosensors. Uh, it could work like that. Those are our nanoparticle, and then it's trapping all the CO2. So if uh, we move uh, farther, we can um, think about Nordays and the Perseverance uh, rover on, on Mars and involved in the Mars 2020 mission, which are searching for biosignature as a possible past in a microbial life and habitable environment. So, is this very relevant to understand where to look for molecules and which are the, the minerals that they are um, better to, to preserve the, the organic uh, molecules? So in order to understand organics and minerals and also that the watery environment that we could preserve that kind of uh, signature, we were testing esmectric as a target mineral for future, future Martian missions. The role of the interlay space in, in clays, it play a crucial uh, role to preserve organic uh, molecules. So we wanted to test nontronite as if, if it was a good reservoir for organic compounds. To look for or finding uh, a trace of a possible primordial Martian life is not an easy task because as the majority of us know, Mars has a radiation, UV radiation very intense, it's very dry and have very oxidizing components. So it's not easy to preserve molecule in that 
uh, so the um, aggressive environment. But if we look closer, esmectite, it has the interlayer space where it can allocate cations, water, and organic compounds. So it's for that that our interest in that kind of, of minerals. So we were characterizing place mineral by different chemical and mineralogy analysis uh, techniques. And we were doing a pretreatment of the clay mineral, alkali treatment, and then acid treatment. And then we were studying, we were analyzing the stability of glycine. The glycine is the more simple uh, amino acid in vivid within nontronite. And then mm, in the, the sample that they were previously exposed to either acidic or alkaline uh, fluids. So we, um, in order to understand this process, we were running infrared and XPS. And the main um, chemical form that it was um, absorbed in the, in the mineral was the citerion, meaning that we have the desprotonation of the, we here have the desprotonation of the carbo, the acid group. So it's a, carboxy, it's a, carbo, it's a carboxylate and then the protonation of the NH3+. If we see that is the, the result from the acid condition, and those are the result from the alkaline uh, condition, both of them preserve the, the molecule, but there are some changes. So for acid conditions, I mean, we, we see the future of the, of the molecule. So there are some preservation of the, of the glycine on, inside of the, of the um, mineral, even after uh, staying several days at the uh, uh, Mars condition. Of course, several days it should, we have to, to move to a longer uh, scale time. And um, then we can see, we can still see the future from the, from the molecule, but furthermore, if we can make a comparison between the acid and the basic conditions in the acid, we see that the NX3 plus component, it gets uh, lower, it diminish, where the NX3 plus component in alkaline condition is still the same. So what it means that? It means that when we expose the, when we do the pretreatment to acid conditions, the channels, the interlayer, it become a, a smaller, where we expose the, we do the pretreatment to alkaline conditions, the, the, the interlayer span, so the, the molecules, can be fit there. In both cases, nontronite is a good reservoir for organic compounds, but as alkaline treat, it provides uh, nontronite a better radiation shield effect as the interlayer is spun. And we can make here a multilayer of, of molecules the, that conferring a better protection against the external condition, where the acid treatment of the nontronite is making the channel narrow and then the glycine is preferably absorbed on the edge of the surface area, and then it can be destroyed. So it's for that the, the, the difference between one and the other environment. So our results demonstrate that esmectite um, that has been previously exposed to different fluids with different pH influence how we are going to, to find the, the glycine in the interlayer uh, region. So the potential preservation of organic compounds is also uh, modified by the pH of the fluids. If we move on to a different uh, system, this one is a magnesium sulfate glycine compound that we are going to study under mass simulate condition. And in this case, I wanted to show uh, Raman results. Here we have the proof here how is attached to the to the main body of the of the chamber and this is the structure of the of the compound the the spectroscopy the raman spectroscopy we use a green laser 532 nanometers and is inside of, of pass a few millimeters from the from the sample and uh, one of the the studies that we have been doing in in this system is we can expose the the sample to the full condition of Mars, meaning the Mars atmosphere, seven millibars of CO2, the temperature and UV. 
but also we can discriminate the different effects of the individual parameters. So that is very relevant to understand what is the critical parameter that is making the change on the, on the molecule. For example, if we expose the, the mineral, the, the system only to the atmosphere, here we were making a comparison between the glycine, the magnesium sulfate, and then the magnesium sulfate with glycine. So, for example, we were seeing, we were just applying a Martian atmosphere, that meaning seven millibar of CO2. We were not doing irradiation, we were not doing temperature. So we saw that glycine, it was uh, high, it was um, showing high stability, whereas the hydratate salt, after few few hours, it was uh, the, the Raman spectra with, was uh, showing the disappearance of the sulfate um, vibration and also the appearance of the new broadband, meaning the amortization of the mineral phase due to the deshydratation process. If we were running the, the experiment uh, at low temperature at 271 Kelvin, we saw, for example, that the temperature provides a stabilization of the target molecule. And then we were, even with XRD, with a dry diffraction pattern, we were not uh, showing many any, any difference between the initial and the final step, providing the absence of the amortization process that we were seeing when we were running the experiment at room temperature. So here, for example, if we discriminate the different parameters, the pressure is critical to provoke deshydratation of the amortization of the target molecule. And also it releases the, the glycine from the, from the matrix compound. Uh, low temperature, provide a great stability to, to the compound and, for example, UV radiation. Uh, if we radiate the glycine, we see that it's a uh, higher destroy, destroy when the glycine is in, inside of the our target molecule, of the magnesium sulfate molecule, is not showing much uh, degradation. So it's also relevant to make a comparison between similar um, molecules but also to discriminate each parameter to see how it is the effect on the, on the samples. Uh, one of the other examples that we were, I, I would like to, to show here is the formation of tripeptide argon matrix, in meaning that in the vacuum system, we sublimate a peptide molecule and then in an argon matrix uh, low temperature, so that is a, a novel system also to, to evaporate uh, uh, molecules inside of the, of the vacuum system and then to do in situ characterization by, by infrared. Here we can see a 208 Kelvin that we don't see the features from the molecule. And as far as we start cooling down the, the system, 90 Kelvin and 77 Kelvin, we see the features from the, from the molecule. And it's telling us that the molecule, it was fully uh, ab uh, absorbed um, fully in a in a one entity. It was not broken from the from the doser or from the, the sublimation uh, system. Then once we form the, the argon matrix of the peptide uh, molecule, we start irradiating the, the sample. And we see here that after yes, 520 after 25 hours of UV, we see that the spectra start changing and we have a new shoulder here in this part of the, of the spectra. If we do a careful analysis of the infrared spectrum, we see that the amide tautomer is converting to the imidic acid tautomer, meaning, and that was confirmed also by XPS uh, technique, by XPS studies. And then the combination of both of the infrared and XPS provide us an evidence how the UV radiation of peptides induce a chemical reaction so the, the conversion from the amide tautomer into the medic acid tautomer. So that is very relevant for biomolecule signatures to search, because if we are looking for biomolecules on Mars, but those molecules, they don't behave as in, uh, on our planet, and the spectra is going to be very different. So we need to know what, how behave the molecules there in order to understand which fingerprints we are looking for. And at least with these spectroscopies. And now I would like to, to move uh, to the biology system. We have been also testing some biology system. 
as I'm going to, to talk about the, the system that we test like and that was in collaboration with the, uh, Dr. De La Torre. And uh, we are um, proving that the simulation chamber are also essential tools for assessment the, the survival adaptation of biological organisms under harsh planetary conditions. We have been testing several uh, different species of lichens, but I'm going to focus in this one just an, an example. Here we can see the, the lichen. Here we can see the, the setup in our uh, sample holder. We have here inside are the, the different lichens. We have two different floors. The first one is um, uh, exposed to Mars condition, full Mars condition and the UV radiation. Whereas the second floor is the, has the same uh, Mars condition, but without UV irradiation in order to have a control samples in the same in the same experiment so the i mean we were not running in situ measurements with the the the, the samples were recovering after the, the experiment and the 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 the, the test was doing outside of the of the of the sample so the test by high resistance and survival capacity was doing out of the of the chamber but we could uh, uh, realize that neither Martian atmosphere nor vacuum condition similar to, to space conditions induce a significant decrease in, in lichen activity or to be exposed to the UV irradiation. So PASCA, our simulation chamber is a, a good uh, method to test the resistant potential of those stemophile organisms under diverse harsh uh, conditions and to assess the, the habitability of extraterrestrial environments. Uh, another system that we were testing was a long time ago was bacteria with the, in collaboration with the Dr. Gomez. And uh, the, the, the microorganisms were exposed to UV radiation, but we were putting the microorganism inside of a Mars regolith analog uh, pellet. And then we were putting the bacteria under two millimeters from the surface and uh, another experiment five millimeters from the from the surface. And we saw that the the conclusion was that the bacteria was was still fine, was surviving in, in those conditions. So the presence of a thin layer of mud regularly, even two millimeters or five millimeters, was very critical and significant to reduce the radiation dose and provide a good shielding to the, to the, the, the layer of the, of the microorganism. So the habitability increased considerably under only a few millimeters of regular uh, protection under, under Mars condition. So again, PASH was uh, helping to test the resistance potential of extremophile organism. And um, by now, I hope that I convince you that the simulation chambers are very useful tools to design and to validate planetary missions. Planetary missions are unique, and of course, the, 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 the information that is given in situ is, is the most relevant one. But again, we can close the cycle because the, the data that is provided by the planetary mission can be again test and interpreted and explode, explode uh, and doing the exploitation of those uh, data and in the simulation chamber, as, I'm was, as I was explaining with the Phoenix uh, mission. So um, maybe I'm running out of time. The planetary simulation chambers are a platform need for the, the design of the future space and planetary mission, as well for the validation of measurements and observation made in situ from orbiter and or surface uh, robots. And uh, they are ideal platform and accurate tool to eva eva evaluate different multidisciplinary astrobiological studies toward the, the origin of life. We have several examples, and I, in this talk, I just wanted to pick up the most uh, relevant ones or the most different ones in order to show the versatility of the chamber and the potential of the of the chamber. I would like to to thank the people from our group, our main collaboration at CAP, and the international collaboration too, 
And thank you very much for your attention. And I will be glad to answer any question. Thank you very much.